Hello and welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's movie is 1961's Bloodlust, directed by Ralph Brooke. Four young adventurers, fascinated by ghastly tales of the fantastic, hunt for and find ah! the unbelievable. Ah! I, who had never killed anything in my life, found myself assigned to duty as a sniper. And what had been an unpleasant duty developed into a passion and then into a lust, a lust for blood. A killer with a crossbow, reveling in brutal torture, driving those close to him insane with terror. We won't fail. We can't fail. In a world that challenges the imagination of man, the living are always with the dead. But you can't mean that you're going to hunt Johnny and Pete like you did those others, as if they're animals. Animals? No, not like animals. I'm going to hunt them as men, men of brains and cunning. And since the unfortunate incident involving my wife has left me without feminine company, I look forward to getting to know you both better. Much better. Well, what do you think? New set. Pretty cool, huh? That's what they gave me instead of a raise. On January 19, 1924, Collier's Weekly published a short story named The Most Dangerous Game by author Richard Connell. It concerned a big game hunter, Sanger Rainsford, getting marooned on Ship Trap Island after falling off a yacht. On the island, he finds a chateau occupied by two Cossacks. General Zaroff and his huge, of course, deaf mute, again, of course, servant Ivan. Having read Rainsford's book about big game hunting, Zaroff recognizes him and invites him to dinner. At the dinner, Zaroff tells Rainsford that he too is a big game hunter but became bored with hunting wild animals because it was enough of a challenge. He then informs Rainsford that he bought the island so he could capture shipwreck sailors and hunt them. He gives them food, a knife, hunting clothes, and a three-hour head start before going out and hunting them down. If they survive for three days, he releases them, but to date, no one has survived that long. Zaroff invites Rainsford to participate, but the latter refuses, so Zaroff op- offers him a deal. Either be the next target of a hunt or get whipped to death by Ivan. Rainsford agrees to the first offer and sets out the next day, laying an intricate trail for Zaroff and then using a series of traps he learned over his, he's learned over the years as a professional hunter. It's a great story, and like most great stories, ended up being made into movies. A lot of movies. To date, The Most Dangerous Game, or a variation of the story, has been made into three radio plays, 19 films, and has had 23 different episodes of various television series based on it. The first film, named after the short story, was filmed in 1932 and directed by Ernest B. Shodzak and Irving Pickell and was shot on sets constructed for the same year as King Kong, which was co-directed by Pickell and Shodzak. As is usual with Hollywood adaptations of perfectly good stories, a woman was shoehorned into the plot as a love interest, and that sorry tradition continues to this day. Count Zaroff's character and nationality was, was changed to whatever villain was pertinent at the time. In 1945's A Game of Death, directed by Robert Wise, Zaroff was named Eric Krieger and instead of a Cossack was transformed into a Nazi. In one version of the story, 1989's Lethal Woman, the Zaroff character was changed to a woman. I haven't seen that one, but I'm sure that, you know, when she finally lures a real man, i.e. an American, 
to the island. She's defeated by him. Bloodlust is not a bad movie. As much as I'd like to see a faithful adaptation of the original story, I've pretty much given up hope of ever seeing one. Although after all the permutations this story has gone through, you would think that someone somewhere would get the bright idea that a story so popular deserves to be adapted faithfully at some point. Since I've learned that the untalented suddenly feel the need to prove that they possess that elusive gift once they get around creative people. You know, that's one thing that's always bothered me greatly about the creative process. Not the process itself, but of course, but, but what goes on when you start working on something. Just the other night, I was going over something very simple. A script outline for another show I'm working on. And this guy who had nothing to do with the show or had any idea of the processes involved started vehemently throwing out completely useless ideas and opinions while we were trying to work. Now, I understand this. Just about everybody, it seems, thinks, you know, it seems, thinks that working on a television show or a movie or a project of any kind is tremendously exciting, and admittedly, it can be. But for the most part, it can be rather tedious, exacting work, and the knowledge of the correct method of building a project is essential. Every once in a while, it can be exciting. Speaking for myself, if I'm in a, you know, a spitballing session and someone throws out an idea I can stick my teeth into, it can be tremendously exciting. I get to my feet and start pacing back and forth, throwing out ideas that just leap full blown into my head. And then excitement seems to communicate itself to the others in the room. The next thing you know, the ideas are flying thick and fast. Working with truly creative, talented people is an amazing thing. You just have to be sure you're surrounded by them to begin with. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often. At the risk of sounding vain, in a situation like that, I try to surround myself with people that are, at the very least, on my level creatively, but they're hard to find. I don't believe I flatter myself when I say that I am very good at what I do. I know I had talent, I, I know I had a talent for it, but as with any talent, until I had an opportunity to put it to work, I didn't know how much or how little I possessed. Once I did, I discovered, much to my delight, that I was blessed with quite a bit. Talk about laying your hands on the axle of the universe. And, you know, until that point, I wasn't sure of what direction my life would take. But once I had the opportunity to flex my creativity, I discovered a legion of talents I didn't even realize I had. It was, as they say, an epiphany, and once I started following that path, it took me into realms that I had no idea even existed. I think that it's like that for anyone who discovers they have a previously undiscovered talent for something. I sincerely believe that everyone has some talent in them, no matter how insignificant it may seem. For example, there's a young lady I know fairly well. She was just a girl when I met her a number of years ago. And she has, after working with the right people who nurtured her talent, absolutely blossomed into quite an accomplished actress and has a very bright future ahead of her. I still remember the first time I saw her. She walked into the indie club meeting, and the second I saw her, I was struck by her presence. She was all of 16 at the time, but it was there just as plain as day to me. At the time, I was casting about for an actress to play a part I had written, and when she turned her head and looked at me, I saw that character standing right there. It was amazing. I imagine I must have looked like a bit of an idiot as I sat there gaping at her, but I was so caught up in the excitement of that moment that I just couldn't help it. I remember blurting out, Please, tell me you're an actress. And when she allowed that she was, I told her not to leave until I had a chance to talk to her. As it turned out, she was perfect for the part I had envisioned as if she'd been born to play it. Now, understand that I'm not claiming to have discovered her or anything like that. After meeting with her and hearing the monologue she was using at the time, it was obvious that she had talent and training and had taken well to it. It was just one of those wonderful moments that happen every once in a while when you do what I do. It was really amazing. And off I go in to get another tangent that has nothing at all to do with the subject at hand. I've noticed that I have a bad habit of doing that during intros, but especially when somebody's interviewing me. I haven't been interviewed often, but I have noticed that you know, when I am, I have this rather scatterbrained talent for going off into the third bardo at the, at the slightest nudge, like I just did now. Anyway, Bloodlust is not a bad adaptation of the most dangerous game. It has, unfortunately, been updated to the time it was made, but being a low-budget film, I suppose that's inevitable. Period films cost a good deal of money, and updating a good story is a good way of ensuring that the end result will be watchable despite a low budget. 
The problem with updating a story is that portions of it will seem outdated in just a few years, so you have to be careful when doing it. I can't tell you how many scripts I've read that were loaded to bursting with pop culture references that would be outdated or worse, extinct once the film was completed. With the passing of years, however, sometimes it works out as the film in question seems to have a peculiar charm, but that's the exception rather than the rule in most cases. Wilton Graff was born Wilton Calvert Ratcliffe on August 13, 1903 in St. Louis, Missouri. Because of his looks, he usually played a slick criminal, a police official, or a lawyer. He appeared in 133 movies and TV shows over the course of his career, starting with 1933's Little Women. He spent about a decade at Columbia Studios, appearing in a number of series and a ton of B-movies before moving on to television and enjoying a long career in that medium. Wilton Graff died on January 13, 1969 in Pacific Palisades, California. Robert Reed was born John Robert Wrights on October 19, 1932 in Highland Park, Illinois. He appeared or starred in 91 TV movies and series and eight motion pictures. His first film was 1957's Pal Joey with Frank Sinatra. An only child, he grew up on a farm in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and graduated from Central High School in 1950. After high school, he attended Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, majoring in drama and then transferred to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London, England. He studied Shakespearean drama while there and appeared on stage in Romeo and Juliet in A Midsummer Night's Dream. He also appeared on The Defenders with E.G. Marshall. He's probably best remembered for the role he had in a show that he actually hated, that of Mike Brady in The Brady Bunch. He didn't have a problem with the role itself or any of his co-stars. What he hated were the scripts. He frequently walked off the set of the show and had many arguments about the quality of the scripts with the show's producer, Sherwood Schwartz. He remembered, Sherwood gave me the plot that sounded wonderful. He put together statistics of broken families, so I said, it was going to be comedic, but it's going to be lifelike. Then I got the script of it, and later, and, you know, and it was just one gag after another, and I thought, I don't think this has much of a chance, but they tell me, you know, you can either do this or Mission Impossible. Anyway, I did this. He sent many long memos to Schwartz complaining about the quality of the scripts and got into arguments with him, making suggestions to improve them. Schwartz usually listened to Reed because his suggestions were good. Reed himself ended up directing several episodes of the show. We fought over the scripts, he recalled, always over the scripts. The producer Sherwood Schwartz had done Gilligan's Island. Just gag lines. That was what the Brady Bunch would have been if I hadn't protested. In spite of his contempt for the show, he truly enjoyed working with his co-stars and in fact became a sort of surrogate father to them taking them on trips on weekends and during the series summer hiatus. He's remembered fondly by all of them. Incidentally, Reed wasn't the first choice to play Mike Brady. Sherwood's original choice was an unknown actor by the name of Gene Hackman, but the studio shot that down. Florence Henderson wasn't the first pick for Carol, either. The part was offered to Shirley Jones, but she decided to do another TV show, The Partridge Family. Just as an aside here, I had a gigantic gigantic crush on Shirley Jones because of her role as Mary in the Librarian in The Music Man. Oof, she was hot. Well, Reed, because of his profession, was very secretive about his private life, although his homosexuality was known to most of the cast members of The Brady Bunch, and they were fine with it. In 1991, he was diagnosed with HIV. Reed got his prescriptions filled under his real name, and the media never caught on. Despite persistent rumors in the tabloids, he never contracted AIDS. After a six-month battle with colon cancer and lymphoma, Robert Reed died on May 12, 1992, at his home in South Pasadena, California. As I said before, Bloodlust isn't a bad movie. It's not a good movie either, but it occupies that crowded space between being good enough to watch more than once and being bad enough to use a DVD as a coaster for your favorite drink. It does show some imagination in its production, so that gives it an edge that... Uh, most of the movies we show are sadly lacking. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Bloodlust, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. <laughs> 